Hello, it's Maxine. Today I'm finally doing a video I've been talking about a lot. Um, I keep saying I want to do a video about my surgery and I haven't even said what the surgery is. So I don't know if anyone's been wondering about that, but um, the thing I'm talking about today is a very common thing that I think a lot of us have dealt with at one point or another or sometimes it's permanent and what it is is hemorrhoids. <laughs> so I had a hemorrhoidectomy. Um, it was the end of it was like the end or the beginning the end of 2021 or the beginning of 2022 like right around that time I think it was the end of 2021 actually but um I just wanted to share my experience because um there's things that I definitely would have done differently after the procedure and um, there's things that I just wanted to like let people know about it if you've been considering get the, getting the surgery and not only hemorrhoids but I have a fissure and even after surgery that's not something that they took care of so for whatever reason they <laughs> it's like my life story it's like anytime I need something like um This video is gonna be really difficult to talk about because um, it's gonna bring back a lot of memories and flashbacks and it's a disclaimer also is that, you know, it's a very, my video is gonna be pretty, it could be triggering, it's graphic, it's um, maybe disturbing, disgusting. If you don't have like a, strong stomach you probably don't want to watch my video but um so a hemorrhoidectomy is a procedure to remove hemorrhoids hemorrhoids are very are um hemorrhoids are enlarged blood vessels and they are very common and most don't need surgery or medical attention or, you know, there's ointments and things that usually help. With me, um, like when I first got hemorrhoids, I was really young and um, I w don't wanna go into depth about too much, but I don't exactly know if um, my hemorrhoids and fissure, which I have a fissure. A fissure is, I should've got the definition, but it's basically a tear in your anus or rectum and um, sometimes it's caused from pushing too much like from constipation or sometimes it could be caused from like um, SA so that's something I don't fully know about but I um, I don't want to get on that subject today but I just wanted to let people know that that's those are some of the causes and um, so as I've mentioned many times I grew up in an environment where um, you know like of course I have good childhood memories but I have a lot of horrible things I ha I dealt with abuse childhood abuse neglect um, you know there's alcoholism gambling cheating adultery um, and sexual abuse that took me a really long time to even recognize that it was abuse and harassment and then there's been flashbacks of things as well and so when you're not getting proper nutrition at a young age I think that can obviously cause constipation but it could be just from other things like I could have just had IBS as it was or later on in life I got all my food sensitivities done with a naturopathic doctor and I feel like honestly ever since having that done I've pretty much 
eliminate like I almost never get constipated now and that was something I dealt with on and off since childhood so I highly recommend seeing them because it's life-changing in other ways not just your bowel movements but like it can affect your skin and brain fog and um a whole bunch of things it's hard to even remember because it's like there's much more to food sensitivities than you would suspect but um back to that time in my life when I first got um that I was taken to the doctor eventually after suffering for some time and they gave me an ointment but it was like something I had to insert myself like four times a day for up to however many days until they went away. But I was so young and I was like uncomfortable. I didn't want my parents touching me down there. I didn't like trust them or feel safe or comfortable to do that. Or, um, you know, the one I did trust more wasn't taking it upon themselves to do that for me. So eventually the ointment just didn't work like I don't know if I had been consistent with it if it would have worked or if it was too far like an oint the ointment would not I don't know exactly but I don't think the ointment would have fixed my fissure which is an anal tear and going back to that a bit because I'm kind of talking all over the place but um an anal fissure is extremely painful and sometimes people compare it to childbirth so like imagine having a tear in your anus like an extremely sensitive area and then having bleeding and pain sometimes like being uncomfortable to sit sometimes blood is like pouring out and it's like it's almost like okay is this a medical emergency like and anyway so eventually I like I wasn't consistent with the ointment no one was helping me the doc my parents the doctors so there's nothing much they could do eventually I just had them and they um I think I had like three or something but two of them were kind of just there and then one of them was like really painful so at times when I was constipated it would be hard to have bowel movements and then it would like reopen the fissure so the fissure would get reopened and be uncomfortable and painful and bleeding and it honestly makes me want to cry like I'm trying to be mature and whatever but it's like I literally dealt with pain in that area for 20 years because I had gotten gotten like multiple I'll get to that point next but I like tried to get help m multiple times with it and it's like <sighs> each time I just was just treated terribly and this is like one of the main reasons I have such trouble trusting doctors and because I just have bad experience after bad experience of them not listening to me or blaming this and blaming me for being too young to experience this and that or blaming me for being overweight for some of these things and it's like you know there's overweight people who don't have these issues and there's people who are healthy who are thin who aren't even healthy in their diet and way of life and then there's people who just average everyday healthy people who still deal deal with these things so it's not fair to like constantly blame being overweight and stuff like that so um so other things that would happen is like I would get almost like impacted it was like hard to even have movements at all sometimes and because I'm such like a granola type of person in my day-to-day -day life like I almost never wear makeup I never take drugs I even when I'm like not feeling well like 
Usually I'll take one Advil on the first day of my period and that's pretty much the extent of drugs that I have taken. On the very, like I don't get sick very often. I have been sick like a few different times in this past year, but I usually can go like once a year and have like one cold or one flu or something, if that. And um, so I just, am, like I try to do things pretty holistically and even in terms of mental health, I haven't taken anything. I've just been able to reach out for other types of help, like therapy and self-help, like reading, learning, to do as much as I can, meditation, and more. Um... So before I had surgery, it didn't seem to matter. Like I've yo-yoed with my weight my whole life. There was a time I got, I was just like the chubby kid and then I got really overweight and then I lost a lot. Then I was like pretty athletic, active, and then I gained, lost, gained. It didn't seem to matter at what size in my life. Like the hemorrhoids weren't just going to disappear. The fissure didn't seem like it was going to disappear. Um, sometimes I'd get bleeding without pain. Like I said, lots of blood, reopen with constipation. Um, when I first reached out for help, I was probably in my early 20s and the guy who had a look at me the first time, he said he could immediately put bands on the hemorrhoids if I wanted, but it was just like an initial consultation and I didn't know if I was ready to like I didn't know what it would be like like he would numb the area put bands on and just send me on my way but I didn't know if I was prepared right at that moment to do that even though I desperately wanted help with this and then within that time frame the doctor passed away actually so I didn't get to see him again and then maybe a year or so later I saw this other guy and like this was before I knew about my mental health like I this was before I knew about being autistic being disabled being having ADHD and fibromyalgia and everything and CPTSD like doctor's appointments were always extremely triggering for me but the second doctor I saw he was like you know I could do this but you're gonna be really mad at me and I just don't know what he meant by that but it was like I understand surgery can have complications or it can be painful and it can be really hard to recover from but like to just say that to somebody and back then I like really struggled in terms of my communication. I've come like a really long way from my early 20s to early 30s to now mid 30s in terms of my communication. So when he's telling me oh you're going to be really mad at me it kind of just I didn't go forward with seeing him again and then I because my, I always worked irregular odd hours and I moved around a bit I didn't ever have like a consistent family doctor which is a problem the third time um well I saw this other doctor and I had like a scope at one point but they never we never made plans to like deal with that area or I just don't remember or I was working too much at that time and I couldn't take time off work I just can't, don't know exactly but finally the fourth doctor was like and this is at the sometime in 2021 I met this fourth doctor so that's only like a few years ago and she kind of seemed like she wasn't wasn't that interested in wanting to do the procedure but I kind of felt like I was begging like saying how long I had been suffering with this and that late at the time it started to get even more painful like even just sitting or sometimes it would it would feel like a sharp pain like shooting right up or um I was just sick of the bleeding I thought that's really not good for me I mean like no wonder 
it's like my iron's normal, but the iron that you store in my body is not normal. And I thought, like, I have no medical background knowledge on this, but in my head, it makes sense. Well, it's like, well, if you're constantly bleeding more than you should, then maybe your body is not storing blood properly. So anyway, um, so I was so relieved for her to say that she was going to help me. And, um, she said that the, the procedure to do the fissure was extremely invasive and, um, that's something that she kind of said that wouldn't be, I don't know, like for just another, like, I know they have to be informative, but they also always like seem to try to talk me out of it. And then I just go, okay. But if I was already getting the procedure to have the hemorrhoidectomy, it would have been really nice to take care of the fissure at the same time. But, um, anyway, so finally on surgery day, you know, I got all the information, like the information said, you can just eat normally right after surgery, but you just have to take this liquid going into surgery so that you're like completely emptied. And well, it said to like, you know, drink a lot of water, stay hydrated, eat like, you know, fiber and things like that. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm already pescatarian. I eat a lot of fruit and veggies. So that's never been a problem. So going in for the surgery, I was like really nervous. Um, it's the first time I had anesthesia and, you know, some things like going right into it, like the nurses and everyone were really nice. Um, and then suddenly, but there was a lot of really screwed up things that happened. Like for starters, they put me in this gown that was too small so my whole backside was open like my back to my butt to my legs and it's like I understand I'm having the surgery in that area but it would have been nice to be treated with some dignity where it's like I'm not walking into the room meeting all the surgeons and staff and maybe medical students like exposed like that like I understand they're gonna see me one way and another anyway but I would have preferred that if I was like asleep not like hi nice to meet you walking in with my ass sticking out of my gown and anyway so another thing so the second thing um like I was really nervous going into it I was kind of like laughing a lot it's like a nervous habit I was like laughing like giggling or whatever anytime they talk to me or ask me questions and stuff because I was just it was like I was excited to finally have it done and then I was like really uncomfortable like thinking about how everyone was gonna see me and then you know they had some nurses come in and they were like nice to me but they were like do you know what procedure you're having today so this is before I was even diagnosed with autism but you could just tell that they could tell I was neurodivergent and so um, back to in the room as I'm getting the needle in the back um, a nurse is supporting me because I'm in an upright position she's supporting me just to make sure I don't like faint or fall or whatever because it's like being numb from the waist down and um, <laughs> Like, I don't know, she probably just meant this in like a supportive kind way, but the way that it was worded, like, like kind of pisses me off to this day. But, um, I was just like saying that I was excited to have this done finally. And then she said, yeah, it's the beginning of the end. And I'm like thinking, okay, I know that it's just a simple procedure, but I'm still going under and I'm nervous. So I'm sure that made my heart rate like skyrocket when she said that. <laughs> like the beginning of the end, like I, I can understand it, but it still is like, could you use something better? It makes me think that I'm about to die or something. But anyway, um, so... So like shortly after she said that, I'm like lied back on the, I like, I'm put to like, I'm, they lie me back on the table and they put the mask on and then I'm like asleep within seconds. <laughs> when I woke up, <laughs> I was like awake as they were, 
like first of all I remember um I forgot to tell them that I never ever sleep on my back so I was kind of curious to see if I had any sort of like sleep apnea or any kind of reaction when I was sleeping on my back like that while they were doing that and um but when I woke up I remember coughing like I felt like I was drowning or choking and then they were moving me from the one what do you call it I don't know if it's called a gurney or what <laughs> um anyway they moved me from one bed to the next and I like was uh, who knows what I actually sounded like but I um I said, um, I was like, oh, I feel bad for you guys having to lift me. Cause at the time I was like at my max weight practically. And then, and then, um, shortly after I moved to like a wheelchair to go into like the post op area. And I'm like, thanks everybody. And, but it probably sounded like, thanks, like, who knows, like, mumbo jumbo. <laughs> but I don't know, I woke up pretty alert. Like, I didn't, definitely didn't um, have a reaction like you see on those videos, I don't think. And anyway, um, so one thing is... They didn't even put gauze on me or anything. It's like I went from literally the chair for, I went from lying down to in a wheelchair to in the post-op area without, like maybe there was something on me temporarily, but I don't think so. Immediately I was like, I was just, once I got sensation back in my legs, I was put back in the same underwear I arrived in. Like I thought that they would, put something on me or something so that was the first or first of many or not the first red flag but one of many red flags and the second thing was um when the nurses were giving me post-op instructions and and they were going to give me this like little bum bath thing it's like this little kind of like a bum bath I don't know how to else describe it like a little toilet kind of thing where you could put water in there just to like keep yourself clean keep the surgery surgical area clean after and the doctor was in the room at the same time and she went oh are you sure and the nurse is just like uh yes so it's like okay I'm not worthy of a freaking a few pieces of sense of gauze and I'm not worthy of this little plastic tub like that's how the doctor was treating me and um also they gave me t3s for pain afterwards which I didn't know until afterwards are extremely dehydrating and lead to constipation so um my writing starts to get messy from here because it's like I was like starting to get angry starting to get sad starting to get like really put back in that place because when I when I think and when I relive memories it's like you know some people can just recount moments in their life but I'm like very visual so I can like really picture being almost back right in that moment um, so then I went home and, you know, a couple days had gone by and I hadn't had a bowel movement yet. So I was just, oh, another thing, um, I, so I was eating healthy, like I was getting my fiber, drinking tons and tons of water, like trying the best I possibly could to avoid like problems but um if I could go back in time I would tell anybody that you should literally be fasting for as long as you can that 
week after surgery. Like I had gone 72 hours before fasting when I was like really big into keto and, and, um, intermittent fasting. So that's what I should have done after surgery, but I just listened to their advice. Oh, you can just resume life as normal. Just make sure to get lots of water and extra fiber. So I went, you know, I had Subway, like one of the first meals I had. I should have just been on a complete liquid diet and not had anything or something worse happened. I don't exactly know, but, um, you know, a few days in, I haven't gone yet. And then all of a sudden it's like, maybe five plus days I hadn't have had a bowel movement yet and that's like very abnormal for me like I always go like once a day even when I'm like constipated it's not something that um you know even at times in my life where I was like keto and fasting and and even the times in my life I was very restrictive, I still went regularly, like I didn't. So um, I started to get worried because I looked it up that like, you know, if you don't go after a certain time, like you can get septic, like the stool within your body not eliminating can like lead to seps, like your blood is septic, which can kill you. So... I went to the hospital, um, cause I lived like, I had other like really bad experiences with doctors and things. And if it's not the doctor who's being rude to me or whatever, it's like the front desk staff. For some reason I had like really bad receptionists and stuff. And this is before I knew it was disabled, but even to this day now that I know that I'm disabled and I try to explain that to people, like, so if they don't get so offended by how I look or how I talk or whatever the case may be. It doesn't matter sometimes. People still treat me like shit. It's like, I'm just not willing to mask anymore. Like I literally, it makes me ill to even think about being phony, like pretending to be happy when I'm not feeling great. Like, especially after surgery, having tile and all that's making me constipated and not having a bowel movement and being worried about that. And, like, I felt like I really, oh, and at this point, I, like, really had to go, like, really bad. It was, like, it was, like, right there, but it would not come out. And it was, like, I was sewn up so tight down there that it was, like, I, like, a finger. Like, most people have bowel movements that are, I know it's, like, oversharing, but we're all human and we all do it. <laughs> And so like, that's all. And I had to go and it was like, no matter how much different positions I was in or having a bath or squatting or like tr everything I did, like it was not coming out. So I was like getting really worried thinking that was like almost practically sewn up, like shut. So I went to the hospital, the E, the, not even just like the emergency, but like the urgent care clinic and I'm lying in there with my like gown and a blanket and on my side because I couldn't sit on like my butt it was like so uncomfortable so it's on my side and the nurse whoever came in beforehand before the doctor like lifted the covers up so I was exposed and one of the the doctor the first thing that came out of his mouth was you don't need to have your bottom exposed. Like I'm literally like suffering. I feel like I'm going to die. Like I'm so exhausted. Like I was so exhausted that when I was like in the shower, I'd be like having to rely on the wall to like keep myself up because I was just like in so much pain and agony and, and like, it just, I felt like I was about to die or something, like seriously, I even, um, the way that he treated me, like, set me off where I had, like, a really strong reaction where he didn't do anything for me, I don't even know how, like, I don't know if I told him off, I cannot remember, I was just so livid, and, um, 
he was just his really arrogant to me I don't remember exactly what he said but it was kind of like one thing after the next like really just so disgustingly rude and then I immediately call up my brand new family doctor who was like the sweetest guy like straight out of med school like really listened to me and spent time with me and I was so looking forward to having him as a doctor but I called there and the receptionist was like you know it was like a Friday or something and she's like oh well we're all busy today there's nothing we can do I'm like yeah I know that but this is kind of like a really bad situation do you think I could just ask him for some advice or something quickly and she's just kind of like nope like nope nothing we can do bye have a good weekend <laughs> meanwhile I feel like <sighs> just like, no one gave a fucking shit about me and so that relationship was ruined because I I lost it at the hospital then I lost it on her like like the way that they treat people now like <sighs> so um so I got like all different types of things you could even imagine at the drugstore like all the different types of constipation type of tools and ointments and just everything and nothing was working I like I like literally think that I there was an extra stitch or something and I had to force myself so hard in the bathtub and in all these different positions that eventually like I was able to go so it's like I had to push to the point where I felt like I was gonna get a uh, I felt like I was gonna get a hernia or I thought I was gonna have a heart attack or I thought I was gonna die like I felt like I know that's like a really shitty way to die <sighs> I thought I could say that and like make it a haha -ha moment but it's like it was not a haha -ha moment it was like the whole thing was like really disturbing disgusting like I feel like I've always been treated like that in the medical medical community they look down on me for being fat they look down on me for being disabled I haven't been able to stand up for myself then finally when I do stand up for myself or even if I say anything at all it's kind of like who the hell do you think you are you're not a doctor you're not a nurse oh I'm just the person living in this body for the past 30 plus years thank you like who's been mistreated abused in and out of the home like was suicidal as a fucking child like can I please have a little decency from someone so anyway um finally I went and then it was like you know I never like ever since that surgery I haven't even had an exam since so I can't even say to this day if anyone like I can't even say to this day if everything healed well what's the issue down there is there anything to be concerned about like I didn't go back to that doctor who did the surgery. I didn't go, I haven't had found a new doctor. <sighs> like it really, the things that I've encountered in my life, like with the medical community is like pushed me to the point where it's like, I don't have a family doctor and I don't need a, need a family doctor. And unfortunately it's like, there's could be a time where I really do need one and I just don't have one. So and anyway um and about the doctor in the ER who was like extremely rude and disgusting to me um I put in a complaint and then like the manager of the hospital called me and he was talking to me for probably like a full 30 to an hour with questions and me to explain the full way through my experience and he you could just really feel like that he was empathetic and he was a sorry and he apologized on that doctor's behalf but not the doctor never apologized to me <sighs> but you know like a lot of things like that have happened to me like and I just kind of let it go because I'm like I don't want to piss off doctors doctors are people like playing god who are like wealthy and powerful and like some of the predators on the planet like 
I don't want to piss off doctors, but finally I just got to this point where it's like, if I don't start speaking up, then these assholes just keep getting away with things. And I'm not saying all do doctors are. There's a lot of amazing doctors out there. There's a lot of amazing medical professionals out there. But um, when you're a disabled person you and fat, you just don't get treated like everyone else. And it's not right. So... You know, um, it probably took like a full year to like really heal, like, um, but I can thankfully say now to at this date, present moment, like I, the bleeding has almost completely stopped just on the very rare occasions that I get constipation now. Like, suddenly, just after having the hemorrhoidectomy altogether, it, like, almost eliminated my constipation. So, it was almost like there was some sort of brain, there was some sort of, like, response from where the pain was happening to my brain that's, like, it wouldn't allow me to go or something. So, ever since it finally got dealt with, now I just go regularly. And I, and I have the same diet I've always had, like, fruit, veggies... Of course, I eat unhealthy sometimes. I'm still very overweight that I'm working on, but I'm still not constipated. So it just is, goes to show that it was extremely necessary. And I wish I hadn't waited 20 years to like, I wish someone had just been really supportive and I wish someone had told me how necessary it was because it really was like you know not does it just not only does it just impact your everyday life like imagine just bleeding from your butt sometimes where you're like worried about going back to start your shift after using the restroom wondering if you're gonna bleed through your pants or something like and in relationships especially like I never wanted men to see me like I didn't want my partners to see me down there so it like really affected my sex life my entire life when you're not like like I already just felt so bad about my body all the way around and then on top of it I have that to deal with so it yeah just really ruined my sex life I mean it didn't stop me from meeting people, hooking up at times, having relationships, but it prevented me from being like carefree and having fun in sexual relationships the way most people do. I mean, a lot of people do have their insecurities, but I wouldn't have suffered so much if I had had that taken care of a lot earlier. So next, um, <sighs> so e even to this day like I've barely looked down there since the procedure but I remember there was a time I did look and I feel like I'm sewn up like a freaking slot in a piggy bank or something like I don't have a regular butthole now it's like <laughs> It's like a slit. So I don't know if that's normal after that, after that surgery, but um, I'm not going to accuse anyone of anything, but the way that I was treated and then the way that I almost feel like I almost died after that to how it looks after, it kind of is a very clear sign that, I don't know, something's not right there. So, um, so, so what I would do differently, as I've said, I would, first of all, make sure that if you're having bad experiences at the doctors, make sure family, friends, 
are coming with you to your appointments and being an advocate for you, especially if you're disabled and you can't and you're they're not listening. They it's like it's like they need to know that people care about you for in order for them to care about you. I don't understand it, but um the things I would do differently is st by starters, I wouldn't have waited so effing long if someone had listened to me or maybe if I really, you know, like as a kid, it's not like I was going to, it was very uncomfortable to talk about. It's not like I really had a lot, a big family and I don't know if I even told my friends about it until much later in life. So that's definitely not something I would have wanted anybody to know so whew, I would have made made I would have going back in time I would have made it very clear that I wanted the hemorrhoidectomy and the fissure taken care of at the same time because it's like you're already there like I'm very thankful that somehow after 20 years of having a fissure and hemorrhoids that bleed like somehow my fissure managed to heal finally after so long it makes me worry that like having wo open wounds and stuff there it's like am I susceptible to getting cancer now or like do I already have that or it's just really I just have to try to push everything that's happened past my mind and just move on and it's like my whole entire life like that's what it's like like from childhood to education to friends to people taking advantage of me to really bad experiences in the medical community somehow I just have to like cut the cord and let it all go but it's like <laughs> it's not freaking hard or not it is not easy and but things like this like sharing it as horrible and awful as it is sharing it I feel like one every video I make about a different subject it's like I'm taking off more and more weight off my back and it's like I can finally breathe even though I'm having like allergies right now <sighs> it feels good to get it off my chest it feels good to share it um you know like Yes, I'm a bigger girl, but I've been trying hard to, like, make changes in my life. Even though I'm a bigger girl, I used to be active. I used to walk and bike everywhere. I've had active jobs. Even my job now is active. I walk the dogs. I eat pretty right. I don't do drugs. I don't smoke. I don't drink it at all anymore. And I haven't for a long time. And it's like, it's like I'm trying so hard to take care of myself. But I feel like things like this has done like damage to my heart like I feel like I'm already I have heart disease or a heart condition from episodes like in my life like this where it's like I've been on the verge of death or mistreated so bad that it's like emotionally my heart is like weak so yeah I should do a video about my near-death experiences because I honestly feel like this was one of them and another would be I almost died at birth and there was a time I almost got hit recently by a truck like I was making a left-hand turn and it just went so it was going like way over the speed limit and it was like inches away from hitting me on my driver's side as I was turning so Yeah, I don't know. I'm a living angel. <laughs> All my enemies would love to hear that. All the people who've treated me like garbage would love to hear me call myself an angel. Anyway, I, you know, people are going to watch my video and they're going to say, oh, victim mentality and this and that. It's like, okay, I was disabled. I grew up in an abus abusive environment. By the time I really wanted to take care of my health and eat right and all those things, it's like I was not listened to. I, um, the damage was done. Like there was ir irreversible damage done to my body that weight loss didn't solve. Loose skin stretch marks. You know, the hemorrhoids weren't 
going away. It's not related to weight, but um, I just want to say, like, unless you've experienced it, you really have no clue. So, um... So I think that's it. Um, it's a very long video today, but it's something I've been wanting to talk about for a long time, like I said before many times, but also, you know, it's a very common thing. So I know a lot of us are suffering with it or have, or they don't know what to do, or they're really embarrassed or ashamed, but I just want to tell you that it's okay, it's common, um, don't let the medical community bully you into thinking that it's not necessary, like, you know, they'll try to ask questions and see the severity of the situation, but even just if it's affecting you to the point where it's affecting your sex life, it makes you not want to have sex or, like, which is a huge part of life, like, not to be gross, but it's like, we all do it. That's how reprodu reproduction happens. That's how you, it's like a stress relief and all the things that makes you closer to your partner. Like, even if, I don't know, that should be reason enough to have it, but, um, you just have to be, you have to try to not, um, like for me, I was in denial about all my problems. I didn't get help with my mental health, physical, anything until I was like in my late 20s. Then I didn't even get diagnosed with autism, ADHD, or CPTSD until my early 30s. So here I am today. And then I got my surgery. And it's like, well, you, like when you're going to the doctor like write things down and have it prepared because sometimes when they put you on the spot it's really hard to, for at least for me to remember like very specific things unless they ask me very specific questions and so then it makes it seem like it's not as severe as it really is or another thing is if you're like me and you've been pushing off these things living in denial trying to just like exist like everyone else in the world and not prioritizing yourself or not fully acknowledging or accepting the problems then when you go to the doctor they you probably fall into this pattern like I did where it's not easy to describe or you make it seem like it's not a big deal like or they ask you pain level scale 1 to 10 or whatever I'm just saying that you have to, you don't have to play up your symptoms, but you have to just make sure that they know how important and how necessary it really is. And anyway. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, like what I said about the doctor and the surgeon for the video, it's like, well, I really hate to think like there was ill intent there, but between the T3s being told almost that I don't deserve the bum bath thing, which is a huge, was a huge help and that I don't, I wasn't even put got, like they didn't even give me like gauze or anything going home. The instructions were not right. I don't think they should t be telling people, oh yeah, just make sure you increase some fiber, drink water. I think people should be on a liquid diet for a few days. But anyway, I don't know how to end my video now. It's like, hi, nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> I just talked about anal bleeding and poop for talked about anal bleeding and like crap for the past hour but ah. anyway thank you so much for um coming to my channel to listen to my video and my experience um 
please like, comment, subscribe. <laughs> please share it with um, somebody that you know suffering with. Or, you know, at least tell them what you learned, or if anything, or what, like, the advice I have after that procedure, for sure. And, um, <laughs> feels good to get it out there, finally. Like, some people would probably have a heart, like, some people would probably be completely in disbelief that I'm talking about this on the internet so freely when I'm not like monetized <laughs> but the whole purpose is to like help people and I know that my channel's never gonna get like big and the whole purpose of my channel is just to help people and get information out because I feel like I have a lot of life experience and I have a lot to share and I just want to try to help people um, feel better about themselves, get the attention, that get the um, <coughs> feel better about themselves, and get the um, medical treatment they deserve. And yeah. Okay. Talk to you later. <laughs> Have a good day.